become increasingly curious about how psychedelics can aid us in a mutation of our consciousness toward the integral, which is sort of similar to what you guys were talking about in terms of integral. Um, but I mean integral consciousness as a new <coughs> way of perceiving and imparting the world within the truth of the transparency of our lives. Two, um, ten years ago, I had an epileptic seizure <coughs> while I was standing at the top of a flight of 12 cement stairs. And I fell face first down and I fractured and dislocated two vertebrae in my neck. And I was in a drug induced coma for three days and had surgery on my neck. And this experience really made me start to question what it was that I was doing with my life and where I wanted to take my experiences. I've always believed in magic and after that experience it became much more apparent to me how real magic is and the synchronicities of our lives. I, that year, my senior year of high school, I became familiar with Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, two American nature philosophers who really inspired me to follow my passion for philosophy and environmental studies and looking at the history of human consciousness and how we have evolved in terms of our relationship with nature. So at a certain point when I was finished with my undergraduate work at the University of California, Santa Cruz, I started to feel pretty uncertain just sort of like Alice when she came to this crossroads, wondering which road do I take next? And you know, if you don't know where you're going, it really doesn't matter, but then you're sort of rolling with, you know, the dice. I have always felt certain about what it is I'm doing with my life. Ever since I was in third grade, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. And unfortunately, at this moment, I came to the crossroads where I felt so uncertain and I had huge fears of what was to come and mostly I realized those fears were of if I was going to disappoint my father who had a lot of faith in me but was also very strict and very hard on me as well. In 2009 Right before I graduated from UC Santa Cruz, I went on a vision quest at Mount Shasta in California. And on this quest, I wanted to see a vision. We had three days and three nights alone, so, uh, water fasting. No use of psychedelics was involved in this experience. And I remember vividly like asking and yelling, please show me something, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I had this song lyric playing in my head the whole time. The eyes are blind. Blue visions are all the seer can own. And it didn't really make sense to me until the third day when my vision started to blur. And it happened in the morning when I woke up and it lasted for about a minute and then it went away and I was a little confused as to what happened but about five minutes later it, it happened again and then again. And by about 5 p.m., I was getting extremely scared of what was happening to my mind, to my vision. And so I left and I came back down to the base camp, to the fire. Four days, my vision blurred like this, every five minutes. And it went through a whole realm of different experiences and fears and what, was my, what were my parents going to think? If I told them that my vision was failing me, how was I gonna get home even from the mountain? The, uh, the fourth day, our last day of the quest, we went to Panther Meadows in Mount Chasta where there's a yearly sweat lodge that happens. And 
I was sitting outside the sweat lodge with a boyfriend of mine at the time who was born on my father's birthday, who greatly exemplified my father's characteristics. And it started pouring rain. And as it was pouring down on us, we sat and talked and suddenly he became a reflection of my father. And I talked with him about all of my fears and all of the things that we were coming up against each other in our relationship that were the same things that I was coming up against with my father. Once I was able to see this clearly, and my relationship with my father clearly, the next day, my vision returned. From this experience, I realized you know, that my father he shows his love in a very different way than I do. I'm a much more physically affectionate person than he is. And, and I realized that his way of strict, tough love is also valid and just as important. As I moved into my master's program, I started to ask, how can I take part in the healing of our world? I saw myself as wanting to share these things that I was learning. But I realized that the healing has to come from within first. And I started to see parallels between the evolution of human consciousness and the evolution in our individual lives. My favorite philosopher, Jean Gebser, He's a German philosopher. He talks about the mutations of human consciousness. And these, like I was saying, I believe are mirrors to the changes that we go through in our individual lives. Here's a picture from his book. His book is called The Ever-Present Origin. Now, in each mutation, we have an efficient phase and we have a deficient phase. And there's in a need for the deficiencies of each part of our consciousness because without them, we wouldn't have the need for a revolutionary change to something new. It's essential. And right now, I believe that we are on the verge of the mutation to the integral from this egocentric world to a presentiating time, space, ego, free world. So now I'm going to go through 10 lessons that I've gleaned from um, Neil Goldsmith's book, Psychedelic Healing. The first lesson is about each drug having its specific effect. In high school, I experimented a little bit with alcohol and tobacco and I decided to quit when I was probably in my sophomore year. And around my junior year, I was invited to a party and I drank some alcohol and I went outside and I took a drag of a cigarette. And the moment that I blew the smoke out, I threw up. And I sat back and I thought, oh my gosh, my body is telling me right now that this is poison. It is releasing these toxins from me. And I didn't really realize what the medicine of tobacco was until years later when I was invited by a Navajo Dine friend of mine, Charles, to sit in a Native American church ceremony. He told me that tobacco is the white man's burden. And as we began the ceremony, corn husks were passed around and tobacco was passed around and every one of us rolled our own tobacco stick. And Charles turned to me and said, this is your prayer stick. And as I began to smoke my prayers and put my intention into the ceremony, I began to feel extremely sick. And I thought to myself, isn't the peyote supposed to make me sick? But I started to realize what he meant by tobacco being the white man's burden. That tobacco's medicine, one part of its medicine is to agitate what is sick within us. And through this agitating, when we engage with something then like peyote, it grabs a hold of what has been stirred up within us in order to purge it and release it from our being. 
And now it's the white man's burden if we just continue to smoke it and agitate our sickness. And no wonder we have so many health problems that come from smoking tobacco. Mm. Peyote, I was told, is the grandfather, or the father. And that archetype is something that really is a powerful archetype to work with. And as I was saying, I was doing a lot of healing around my experiences in my relationship with my father. My Diné friend Charles told me that peyote is a long road. And I get that now because after years of my experience, I'm still taking in things that I've learned. Just like you guys said, with you know, the fewer experiences, sometimes the more potent the healing can be. When I first started taking psychedelics, it was at music festivals. And, you know, not everyone has a healing journey at a music festival. Um, but I believe that, you know, the, the setting, it matters. And it can very strongly influence the state of mind, of course. And if, you, if you're in a community that is supportive of that, even if you're at a music festival, you can still have an amazing experience. But for me, I was really curious in looking at a structured experience like the Native American church ceremony. And so when Charles finally invited me to come and sit with them, I was elated. And it was synchronistically for a Father's Day ceremony. The setting of the, of the Native American church with the teepee, with the fire, with the circle, the prayer songs, it all serves to create a safe container and a place in which visions can be born and you can be set into a trance state and guided. Mindset is probably one of the most important factors in having a healing experience with psychedelics. There is a very fine line between vision and delusion. And your state of mind will affect that outcome. For me, with the peyote ceremony, my intention was around understanding my father and healing the relationship that I have with him. And the Diné TB ceremonies have a very powerful persuasion to the emotions. It's an extremely emotional experience. In general, of course, dose ex will determine a mild or extreme experience, but it really isn't as important as your mindset. In my peyote journey, I really didn't take a very high dosage, and yet I had an extremely powerful psychedelic experience. I purged, I went through all of the processes. It was a low dose, but because my mindset and my intention were clear, I had a very high experience. At a certain point, after the tobacco started stirring up this feeling of sickness within me, and I had eaten the peyote, I started to feel the pain of my neck injury <clears throat> that I had survived years before. And it started to radiate down my spine and, and then pulsate outward into every injury I have ever experienced in my life. It became so intense. The pain of it was unbearable. And I know that the structure of the peyote ceremony is very strict. You're not allowed to stand up and leave. You're not allowed to lay down. You're not allowed to speak. But I turned to Charles my teacher, and I asked him if I could lay down because the pain was so unbearable. I knew I was stepping out of the structure. He allowed me to lay down, and I fell asleep for a brief moment. And in that sleep, I fell into the void, the darkness, but I felt safe there. I felt held there. And before I woke up, I heard the voice that I always trust ask me the same question that Baba Ramdas was asked when he was having his first intense psychedelic experience. But who is minding the store? And in that moment, I awoke to a feeling of light within me, and the fire in front of me began to 
cleanse me with its light. I can't overemphasize the importance of preparation and knowing this plant spirits that you're involving with. For me, I did lots of research about these subjects. I looked into peyote and the traditions around it and how the plant spirits are used to guide our healing. I also have become very curious in archetypal studies so that I could interpret my visions as they came to me. And my curiosity, like I was saying before, about the human life cycles and therefore rites of passage that are experienced cross-culturally. The ritual of the Native American church, a lot of people, as I talk to them about this, they say that they don't like it because it's very strict and extremely structured. I personally, as I was coming through my experience and learning about who my father is and what he had taught me about the importance of structure, I understood why the peyote ceremony is so strict. The ritual is able to gift us this wisdom from hundreds of years of practice. The fire, as they build, the fire is like this arrow pointing inward to the teepee, pointing at the mound of earth that represents the peyote road as a crescent around the fire. And I realized that this fire pointing inward was like the inward light and the light coming in and cleansing me. The ritual aspect of it is so important because then we can include our children. There were three young children sitting with me in ceremony that day. In our culture, we don't have the ability to talk to our children about these substances because they're illegal. And then their children are going to grow up and experiment with them anyways without the ritual and guidance to support them in having a truly healing experience. And through this, this wisdom that I had gained about peyote being the, the archetypal father that it is, I felt it start to take on the weight of my pain and help me to start release it, just like my father takes on the weight of my pain that I experience. It's his way of showing me his love. As, as I felt the peyote taking on my sickness, suddenly I purged it and I had a physical throwing up. And it was so powerful to feel acknowledged in this release, in the circle. As I purged, the fire tender came by and showed me his gratitude for my release. And he cleaned up what I had let go and brought it outside of the teepee and out of the circle to let it go back to the world. Afterwards, I started to feel a range of emotions come up. Again, painful emotions. And I started to cry for all of the things that I had experienced in my life that were painful. And I cried for hours. It wasn't, the sun hadn't even come up yet. And I kept crying and crying, and eventually it wasn't even for my pain anymore. It was for the pain of everyone in our circle. And then it was for the pain of the whole world. And suddenly I felt like Atlas holding the weight of the world on my shoulders. At the closing of the ceremony, the support that I received from the roadman was so valuable. Again, it taught me this tough love. He completely called me out on laying down in the ceremony. And I felt a little embarrassed, but I also felt like I was learning you know, how to show respect. He also acknowledged my crying. And he said, look, she's crying for all of us right now. It's so important to have a supportive community to come back into after a psychedelic experience. 
And in the Dainé tradition, ritual psychedelics are embedded within the foundation of their culture. Unfortunately, we in the West do not have that foundation. And so it's important for us to create that. I feel very blessed at the fact that I come from a community in California which is very aware of psychedelic use and its potential for healing. And so when I returned home from the reservation to California, I was greeted by a community that understood what I was talking about. And I was able to communicate to them and share my experiences, which helped me integrate that into my life. Uh, I think that this harkens to the need for legalization, you know, because w without that, we're not going to be able to create a community that's, that's open enough. Now, spiritual practice, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily like the word spiritual because they feel like it has a certain loaded connotation to it. But for me, a spiritual practice is like Neil Goldsmith says, a practice of self in culture, in nature. Finding yourself in culture, in nature. <coughs> Spiritual practice for me is a process of learning and loving and growing. And if we can integrate that within every moment of our lives, then every experience is a spiritual practice and can offer us truly lasting growth. A revised worldview for those of us who really try to integrate our psychedelic practice is really almost inevitable. <laughs> we start to see the world in a whole different way. It becomes much more transparent to us. And I think then, therefore, we start to take this leap that my favorite philosopher, Gebser, starts talking about with just to the integral, to a fourth dimensional consciousness, <clears throat> one where we are free of the boundaries of time and space, we were free of a linear mental construct of reality where we were able to see the world as not only scientifically observable, but as a magical and mythical experience as well. And not just as one separately from the other, but as a whole, as an integrum. And through this, we begin to experience the world in truth and express ourselves in truth. So um, I'd just like to end then with saying that the importance of using psychedelics for therapy is to give us balanced relationships within our lives and our world, to give us power with the world, with each other, with our soul. And I encourage us all to become the eyes of the world. Thank you.